The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Since the Equitable Life Assurance Society was founded 90 years ago, this country has changed in many ways. But in one respect, it is still the same. In those early days, people always spoke of America as the land of opportunity. Well, it still is the land of opportunity just as much as ever. In just a few minutes in tonight's middle commercial, the Equitable Society will have a special message for listeners who agree with this philosophy. We will describe a special life insurance plan for men and women on the way up, offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Tonight's FBI file, Murder on the Midway. The traveling carnival, once an institution, is fast disappearing from the American scene. Their gradual disappearance is a great pity, if only because it means that many a small-town child will grow up without ever having seen the fearless daredevil who did his dive from the high platform into a shallow tank of water. Nor shall he ever see the fabulous fat lady, the bearded lady, or the pretty young girl who was advertised as being able to shoot better than Annie Oakley. The majority of those shows which still manage to tour the country and bring joy to children of all ages are composed of old-timers who are the last link America has with the show business of yesterday. As such, they are deserving of our complete respect, for they have brought laughter and excitement wherever they went. Unfortunately for them... That respect is often withheld because a few, a very few of the groups of traveling performers still among us are not more than transient groups of rogues, drunks, and common thieves. Tonight's case is the story of what went on at one of the latter type shows, both out front and backstage. Tonight's file opens at a traveling carnival which has just arrived in a small New England town. It is mid-afternoon, and Eddie Scott, a pitchman with the show, is walking down the midway. Eddie! Eddie, my boy! What? Oh, hello, J.C. May I have the pleasure of a few words with you? Yeah, sure. Eddie... I want to tell you about a magnificent plan I have. Uh, look... Uh, Eddie... I like you, son. Like you. And I'm going to show my friendship in a concrete fashion. Yeah, that's fine. Hey, don't, yeah. don't go, my boy. Don't go. I'm going to move you to the head of the midway. Yeah, well... I'll build you a stand that'll be the envy of every other performer with the J.C. Crawford Sunflower Carnival. All right, but I... You'll send thousands of watches a day. Yeah, yeah, I know, J.C., but in the meantime, i got to go set up the stand I got uh, now. Wait, wait, Eddie, wait. I, uh... I don't want to impose, son, but uh, I promised Lily Bell I'd bring her some horoscopes. Uh, go buy her tent, will you, and, and give her those rather ungainly crates, huh? Well, look, I... Uh, I thank but... you, my boy. Uh, yeah, thank but... You. But look, Jack... When you leave her tent, you'll be half for your analyzer. And because this hey, Walla. is a special matinee... Hey, Walla. We have... Huh? Oh, hello, Eddie. Hi. Some horse goats for Lily, fell. she inside? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Drew. Yeah. And ladies and gentlemen, we have brought this uh, great attraction at tremendous expense to you. And I'll come back. Lily, Bell. 
Eddie Scott. Come on in. Hi, Eddie. What's playing? Uh, J.C., give me these horoscopes, please. Yeah. Throw them by the trunk, will you? Yeah, sure. How late do we work? How do I know? Oh, didn't J.C. tell you? Oh, he's loaded. Didn't even know his own name. You know something? He still don't lose that con. He got me to carry these things all the way over here. Hey, Lily Pearl. What's this? What? There's jewelry in a trunk. Leave it alone. Looks like the McCoy. Well, it ain't. It's costume junk for the act. Oh. I never saw costume stuff like this. Well, I bet you Blow, could sell Eddie. that for the... Huh? Put that stuff down and get out. Meanwhile, at a nearby FBI field office, Special Agent Taylor is just leaving the office of the agent in charge when he sees Agent Clinton Forrest in the hall. Hello, Clint. Oh, hi, Jim. Oh, you saved me a trip. I'm just going by to your desk. Yeah, why? Well, as of a couple of minutes ago, we were assigned to the same case. What is it? A jewel theft took place sometime last night or early this morning aboard a train that left Boston at midnight. The Indian Head Limited. Any description on the thief? No, no one saw him. Not even the person who was robbed? No, the victim was an old lady traveling alone. When the porter tried to wake her this morning, she didn't respond. A doctor, who had the next compartment was called, he said the old lady had been chloroformed. Well... When she was brought around, she said that she forgot to lock her compartment door, and that's the last thing she remembers. Hmm. Any value on what was stolen? $23,000. Oh, we have got one lead. What's that, Jim? Well, the local police at a town called Harrisonville boarded the train as soon as the robbery was discovered. They found a small clump of dirt in the compartment. From its size and shape, it apparently had stuck to the arch of a man's shoe. Mm -hmm. The lab just reported that they've analyzed it, and it contains bits of sawdust, confetti, and popcorn. Sounds like a circus. Well, I checked with the railroad. And for part of the night, they were hauling four cars belonging to the J.C. Crawford Sunflower Carnival. I see. Oh, where is that carnival now? It's at Union City for a five-day stand. The local police there have started preliminary investigation. Well, Jim, the chief at Union City is a graduate of the FBI Academy. Yeah, I know that. Uh, Clint, how about you getting a list of the stolen jewelry from the police up at Harrisonville? Then you can send out a stolen property flyer. Okay. Uh, where are you going? Well, the SAC is sending me to Union City to investigate that carnival. Lily Bell? What is it, Walter? I, uh, I gotta talk to you. Look, we got trouble. Huh? Yeah, there was a cop around talking to old man Crawford about the jewelry. How come? Oh, I don't know. How do you know somebody from the carnival took it? Honey, you're the mind reader. Oh, very funny. What do we do now? Just keep the stuff in your trunk and make sure nobody sees it. It's too late. Huh? Somebody has seen it. Who? Eddie Scott. Well, how did he see it? Yeah, he brought in a crate of horoscopes. Told him to throw them next to my trunk. The next thing I know, he's got the stuff in his dukes. Oh, fine. Yeah. Asked me if it was real. I told him no and kicked him out. Mm. That ain't good. He'll hear about the cop and get smart. Should we bury the stuff? No, no. We just can't leave it in the trunk. Order! Order, where are you? It's J.C. Yeah, yeah. I'm uh, back here, J.C. Hey, you got a crowd, my boy. You're neglecting your spiel. I'll be right out, sir. What do we do? No. Well, try to think of something. I'll see you later. Pardon me. Huh? Are you J.C. Crawford? Oh, oh, yes, sir. J.C. Crawford in person and at your service. Thank you. My name is Taylor. I'm a special agent of the FBI. The FBI? That's right, sir. Here are my credentials. Oh. Yeah. That's a good picture of you. Uh, Mr. Crawford, could uh, we go someplace where we can talk? Why, uh, well, surely, surely, uh... Hey, let's go have a drink. Well, I'd rather go where it's a little quieter, if you don't mind. Well, uh... Oh, uh... Oh, this tent here. It's my office. It's fine. Yeah, go ahead, sir. Thanks. Yeah. 
Mr. Crawford, Chief Thompson of the local police told me that he's already spoken to you about the jewel theft on the train last night. Yeah, that is correct, sir. Have you any idea how many people you have traveling with this carnival? Oh, I have indeed, sir. Answer is 55. 55 great performers in my show. I'd like to uh, question all of them as soon as possible. Mm, yeah, can't be done. Oh, why not, Mr. Crawford? Oh, busy, busy, busy. They're entertaining the grand citizens of this community. Well, what time does the show close? Eleven o'clock. Can you arrange for me to question them after that? Why, uh, well, certainly, certainly. Be happy to. Thanks. Uh, let's see. Uh, what time is it now? Uh, it's a few minutes past nine. Well, uh, we got two hours till the show closes. Um... Uh, I'll tell you what we ought to do. What's that, sir? Let's you and me go out and have a few friendly libations, huh? Oh, thanks, Mr. Crawford. Yeah, but you If see... you don't mind, I'd like to take a look around the lot. Oh. Oh, well, uh, we're all right. Uh, here. Here, take some passes. Thanks. And uh, <clears throat> if you have need of my services before 11, you may find me at the end of the midway. Can't miss the place. It has a large sign outside featuring the most beautiful words in the English language. We serve whiskey. And now a question from L.J., whose birthday is July 25th. L.J., you were born under the sign of Leo, and therefore... This is a favorable time for you. There is an old Turkish proverb, a man does not seek his luck, luck seeks its man. So you can see that even in ancient days, the Turks realized how important the position of the stars was to every one of us. And now for the next question, this one is from E.S. Born on March the 22nd, which is the sign of Aries the Ram. He asks... I'm, I'm sorry, yes. Your question cannot be answered. That's all for this show, folks. Oh. Lily Bell. Lily Bell. Come in, Walter. Say... What happened? Why did you cut the show? Eddie Scott was out front. He sent me a note. It said, do I get cut in or do I tell what's in your trunk? Oh. Well, we got to do something quick. The FBI's looking for the jewelry now. How do you know? Old man Crawford told me there was a G-man around to see him. When? About an hour ago. He's going to put the vacuum on all of us after the last show. You think he'll dip into everybody's trunk? Well, he could. Lily Bell. It's Eddie. What do I do? Talk to him. Talk to him. I'll, uh, I'll step back here. Okay. Come on in. Hi, Liliba. Hi. I'm uh, sorry I broke up your act that way. What do you want? Like I told you in the note, I'd like to be cut in. How much? Well, I want to be fair about it. Yeah. What would you think of, oh, I'll say... 50%. You want half? That's right. You expect to just walk in and cut yourself down the middle? Uh-huh. That ain't what you're getting. It ain't? No. Your cut's already been figured. Oh. Oh. What is it? This. Huh? Oh. Honey, that's the best fortune you've told in weeks. Open tonight's FBI file in just a moment. Now, a special message to a very special kind of person. To the man or woman who can truthfully say to himself, I'm on the way up. Can you speak those words and really mean them? Are you the kind of man whose neighbors will say, Look at the Barton's new car. Why, Ed's new job must be working out all right. If you're that type of person, if you're absolutely confident that your earning power is going to increase in the next few years... If you have plenty of honest-to-goodness faith in your own future, then here's a suggestion. 
Investigate the Equitable Society's special life insurance plan for men and women on the way up. A life insurance plan that offers you these three distinct advantages. First, immediate protection. The moment you sign the contract, you enjoy the peace of mind that comes from knowing that your wife and children have the protection they need. Second, the equitable plan provides for readjustments in the future. Five years from now, when you're making more money, you can make up your mind whether you want more protection or bigger cash values. Or you may decide to work out a retirement program. In other words, your life insurance keeps in step with your income. Third advantage, the equitable plan is flexible at all times. It can expand or contract as you see fit and offers you many desirable options which your equitable society representative will be glad to explain to you. So why not get in touch with him immediately, phone him as soon as possible, and ask for full details on the equitable plan for people on the way up or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, Murder on the Midway. If you are like the ordinary person, you pick up your newspaper, notice a story about some local holdup or jewel theft, and you skip over it because you regard it as too insignificant to take up your time. It is, in your eyes, just another petty theft. But it is not petty, even though the amount stolen in any one robbery may be so small as to be negligible. Crime today is big business. And nothing illustrates that better than statistics gathered from a recent survey made by the Federal Bureau of Investigation. In one recent six-month period, the value of property stolen in the United States amounted to well over $57 million. In order to garner that loot, 336,000 crimes were committed. Those are sobering facts. But even more noteworthy is the accompanying fact that in many of those crimes, the thief was aided in no small measure by the victim. Carelessness, such as the failure of the robbery victim in tonight's case to lock a compartment door when she went to sleep. Carelessness like that is an ally of the criminal, an ally without which his operations would be considerably lessened. Your FBI hopes that you will try to avoid such carelessness. By doing that, you will be hurting the chances for success of our common enemy, the criminal. Tonight's file continues later that night at the FBI field office. Hello? Hello, Clint. Jim Taylor. Oh, hiya, Jim. I think we may have something on that jewel theft. Good. I've just finished questioning the employees at the carnival. One of the pitchmen didn't show up and couldn't be found. When was he last seen? Earlier tonight. After the questioning was over, I went to his living quarters. It's a leaky tent here on the fairgrounds. Uh, find anything? Yes, the small jewel box that was stolen from the old lady on the train was in his trunk. Anything in the box? No, it was empty. What's this employee's name, Jim? Edward Scott. Now, I had a full description wired into the office by the local police here. Good. An alarm's already gone out from this point. Oh, Clint. Yeah? Will you ask the Bureau to have some flyers printed up? Right. Uh, when do you think you'll be back? Oh, I'm getting a train out of here in uh, an hour. I'll see you in the office first thing in the morning. Huh. Walter? Hmm? Walter, I've been looking all over for you. Oh, what's the matter? Eddie's body is gone. Is that all? Look, put those darts down and talk to me. I want Lily to... Lily Bell, I took him. Huh? I took him. You see, I heard the FBI guy talking to Crawford. He thinks Eddie did the job. Because he didn't show up? Well, that was one thing. Then he found the jewel box I stuck in Eddie's trunk. Oh. Well, what'd you do with Eddie? Dumped him. Where? <laughs> He's safe. 
Pretty good, huh? Walter, let's quit this show, huh? <laughs> Not yet. Not till things cool off. Hey, look. What? I got a bullseye. Left-handed. <laughs> Morning, Clint. Morning, Jim. Anything in yet on the Eddie Scott alarm? Not a thing. No. I teletyped Scott's name and description to Washington. We ought to have something from them later in the day. Mm -hmm. Oh, Scott had no regular home, Clint. Mm -hmm. According to everything I could find out at the carnival, he used to get his mail care of Billboard magazine, and they'd forward it on to him. Mm -hmm. We've notified them to call the New York office as soon as they hear from Scott with his new address. Oh, pardon me, Clint. Sure. Special Agent Taylor speaking. Hello, Mr. Taylor. This is Chief Jones at Union City. Yes, Chief. I've got some news on Eddie Scott. He's just been found dead. He what? He was brought in a little while ago. Well, Chief, we'll be down there as soon as we can. Oh, Clint. Hmm? Chief Jones said we could use his office. Oh, fine. Oh, uh, you find anything out at the fairgrounds? No, not a thing. I spoke to Crawford, but <laughs> it's such a hangover, he wasn't very coherent. Mm -hmm. Oh, I learned how Scott was found. Uh, where did they find him? On a houseboat at the lake, a couple of miles up the road. Some kids were playing on the deck of the boat. They accidentally started a fire. Mm -hmm. Instead of running away, they called the fire department, and firemen found the body propped up in a closet. Was the murder committed on the boat? Well, it looks like Scott's murderer took his body up there to hide it. How was he killed, Jim? Well, he was struck on the back of the head with a dull-edged weapon. Oh, possibly a hammer. Are, uh, are those Scott's effects on the table, Jim? Yeah. yeah that's it. Have you examined them? Yes, I've just been through them. Find anything useful? Well, this might be something. This pad? Yes, there's some indented writing on the top sheet here. What does it say? Well, I have... Hold it, Hold it at the right angle and I'll read it for you. Ah, yeah, I got it. Um, E.S., March 22nd. Yeah. Uh, do I get cut in, or do I tell what's in your trunk? Hmm. Well, that ES probably stands for Eddie Scott. Yes, I'm sure it does. But what about the March 22nd and the rest of it? Well, I've been trying to figure that part out, Clint. Uh, Scott had... Hey, wait a minute. Huh. I think this might be a lead. Huh. I remember the other night while I was at the carnival... There was a fortune. And now a question from B.L., whose birthday is May 29th. B.L., you were born under the sign of Gemini. Pretty corny, isn't she, Clint? Yeah. I hope this works. Jim, if, if you're right, and she's the one Eddie Scott wrote that other note to, she's got to show some reaction when she gets the same note after he's dead. Yeah. What made you think of her? I saw her work when I was here last night. You see that wicker basket up there on the stage? Uh -huh. Well, that's where she throws the slips of paper with her questions on them after she gives her answers. And now, this is it, Clint. Yep. On March the 22nd, which is the sign of Aries, the ram. In answer to your question, E.S. Uh, Look at her, Clint. Ladies yeah. and gentlemen, that concludes this show. Good night. She's leaving, Jim. Oh. She's got a little tent right out in back of this one, Clint. Go get her. Mm -hmm. I'm going to grab that wicker basket up on the stage. Okay, yeah. Come in, sir. Let us through, please. Barnes. See you later, Clint. Yeah. Excuse me, please. Excuse me. Coming through. Thank you. Excuse me. Thank you. Say, uh, can you tell me how to get to the great Lily Bell's tent? Sure, it's right back there. Oh, thanks. Hello. Who are you? I'm a special agent of the FBI. Here are my credentials. What do you want here? I'd like to ask you some questions. Go ahead. Just how well do you know Eddie Scott? I just knew him to say hello to. What do you mean, knew him? Has anything happened to him? 
I don't know. I don't know anything about him. Hardly knew him. I think maybe we better do the rest of this questioning down at police headquarters. Oh, no, you don't. Huh? Keep your hands over your head. Chief has got a gun on him, Lily Bell. Okay. No. No, no, he hasn't. Keep your hands in the air anyway. Get the stuff, Lily Bell. Let's get out of here. What about this guy? Get the stuff out of the trunk. I'll take care of him. Okay. Drop that gun, huh? I said drop it. Oh, no. Oh! Now, get up. Come on, get up. And leave that gun right where it is. Did you find the note that Eddie Scott wrote yesterday, Jim? Yes, it was in the wicker basket up on the stage. Good. All right, Clint, let's throw the cuffs on both of them and get out of here. Although charged with violation of the National Stolen Property Act, Walter Marshall and Lily Bell Adams were turned over to local authorities and convicted for the murder of Edward Scott. Walter Marshall was executed, and Lily Bell Adams received life imprisonment. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI was not solved because of any sudden inspiration or any lucky hunch. Few cases are solved that way. The arrest of the criminals portrayed in this file was brought about the same way almost every other arrest comes to pass as a result of calm, deliberate, painstaking investigation, plus, and this is a very big plus, the close and valuable cooperation of local police. Your FBI is proud of the fact that more than 97% of all persons arrested by special agents in the past year were later convicted after a fair trial in a court of law. That is a superlative record, and your FBI wishes to take this opportunity to acknowledge publicly that it would have been impossible to obtain such a margin of convictions if it had not been for the invaluable aid rendered to special agents in every part of the nation. Only through this kind of teamwork between law enforcement agencies can any real progress be made in the war against crime. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Old-timers in the life insurance profession have a saying that may interest you. They say... You can judge a man by the life insurance he buys. In other words, veteran insurance men have noticed that their customers who make small-scale insurance plans seldom get very far. On the other hand, the type of man who thinks big who invests in a forward-looking program like the Equitable Society's plan for men and women on the way up, is the man who usually does get to the top. So why not line yourself up with the successful men of tomorrow? Ask your Equitable Society representative to give you full facts and figures on the Equitable Society's plan for men and women on the way up. Or write care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. <laughs> Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, a story that reveals a ghoulish attempt to evade the law. Its subject, bank theft. Its title, The Traveling Corpse. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry D. Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the traveling corpse on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.